Welcome back as we continue our journey in the book, The Salvation is from the Jews, by author Roy Shulman. We will be going through the chapter 8, The Jews and the Second Coming, with this episode. And you, you closed the last episode with uh, the, the discussion that perhaps these events and the uh, persecutions of the Jews in the, the last century and the motivation of the Muslim faith we're all has had something to do with the second coming and the prophecies we see. Maybe we could start there and, and pick it up. With. The um, suggestion that I was making at the end of the last show was that there is uh, obviously something spiritual and something mysterious about, first of all, anti-Semitism in general, but uh, in particular, this um, attempt to exterminate the Jews, eradicate the Jews that we saw in the Holocaust and that we see um, echoed, unfortunately, uh, coming from um, the Muslim world at times, including now, actually. And um, in fact, if I just can back up a little bit on that, the, um, I, mentioned, um, I mentioned in the last show some of the, some of the aspects of Islam which, which look quite suspicious about where the impulse might be coming from. And um, I know that what I just said, basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to justify a statement that I just made implicitly, which was that on the one hand, the Nazis wanted to exterminate the Jews, and I kind of imply that that's true in Islam also, and that's a pretty controversial statement. But in fact, Islam teaches that, um, that the day of resurrection cannot happen until all the Jews are killed. So there, too, you have a kind of, you ki have a kind of mirror image of Christianity, because Christianity actually teaches, the Catholic Church teaches, you can't have the second coming until the Jews are converted. Right. And Islam teaches that the day of a resurrection won't happen until the Jews are killed. And the quote uh, actually is, quote, the day of resurrection will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them, and until a Jew hiding behind a rock and tree, and the rock and tree will say, O oh Muslim, O oh servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. So, I know this is an odd introduction into what I'm about to talk about, but the uh, suggestion that I was making is that there's something very pointed and very suspicious about this diabolical desire to kill the Jews and this association between the, um, either the conversion of the Jews and the killing of the Jews and the Second Coming. Now, as Catholics, we know uh, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church that the second coming can't happen until there's a conversion of the Jews. And we know that from paragraph 674, which says, quote, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. So the suggestion that I was making near the end of, of the last show was maybe this hatred of the Jews and maybe this desire to exterminate the Jews came from the diabolical desire to abort the second coming, to prevent the second coming from happening, because for the second coming to happen, there will have to be Jews, and there will have to be a conversion of the Jews. Um, so, I guess uh, um, if I if I'm making that equation between the Holocaust and the attempt to exterminate the Jews, and the um, conversion of the Jews necessary for the second coming, uh, maybe I should just launch into why I think this whole area is kind of suspicious and kind of suspicious now, and why it pays to look at what's happening, and to at least look at what's happening and line it up against what we know about the second coming, what we know about the state of the world to precede the second coming. Uh, not because, um, unlike some perhaps Protestant TV shows, I'm not preaching that the second coming is around the corner, but we know the second coming is going to happen. That's not optional, right? right. That's dogma and that's in, even in the creed. And we don't know when it's going to come, but we do know what, 
we, we, have some, we have some signs of the times about what is supposed to happen before the second coming and what the state of the world is supposed to be like before the second coming. So I think at every moment of history, it's worthwhile to look at the world around one and look at the prophecies about the second coming and just kind of, um, uh, you know, take a little, little check of, you know, how things line up and where one might be. So what do we know about the second coming? We know, um, we know something about the second coming from the words of Jesus himself in Luke um, chapter 21. And I want to get this word for word, so if you'll bear with me, and I will um, turn to the page. Um, this is the words of Jesus himself prophesying over Jerusalem shortly before the crucifixion. I'm reading from uh, Luke chapter 21, starting around verse 23. Um, uh, Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword, and the Jews will be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Okay, so here we have Jesus himself laying out a timeline. Um, I'll, I'll go back and unpack it a little bit. Please. Uh, Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword, and the Jews will be led captive among all nations. Literally fulfilled in 70 AD, Jerusalem fell by the edge of the sword. Um, there were still Jews left in Jerusalem at that time, but they had another revolt around 135 AD, and when that revolt was crushed, um, they were exiled from Jerusalem under pain of death. And the Jews were led captive among all nations. The Romans took them away as slaves. And uh, going back to the words of Jesus, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Literally uh, fulfilled, right? Jerusalem was in Gentile hands continuously from that point in time, one, about 130 AD, until 1967, when for the first time in almost 2,000 years, the old city of Jerusalem returned to Jewish hands. And then Jesus immediately goes into a description of the second coming signs and sun and moon and stars and upon the earth distress of nations and so forth and then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory so we have quite a timeline there right um, the fall of jerusalem the dispersal of the jews the Jew jerusalem being held in gentile hands by implication the return of uh, jerusalem to jewish hands and the return of the jews and then the second coming and the, uh, when the time of the gentiles are fulfilled and the time of the Gentiles fulfilled refers back to where you've, you've shared with us a couple of times from St. Paul, where their eyes were darkened so that the, the Gentiles could come into the faith. That's right. Uh, I might as well go there now, since you bring it up kindly. Um, we, we see that same phrase, more or less, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled in the words of St. Paul in his letter to the Romans in chapter 11. Um, St. Paul says... Lest you be, now I'm reading uh, Romans 11, starting at verse 25, but I'm going to be moving around a little bit within chapter 11 to, to pull things together. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So St. Paul is saying a hardening has come upon part of Israel, he says uh, earlier in the same chapter, quote, um, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Okay, so St. Paul is saying here that I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel. Their eyes have been veiled. Um, they've been given a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, until the full number of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Then all Israel will be saved. And that is uh, one of the scriptural sources for the church teaching about the conversion of the Jews to precede the second coming. Right. That line itself, um, until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved, has always been taken to refer to 
the conversion of the Jews uh, to precede the second coming. And that was what you quoted earlier from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That's right. And, and that, that um, uh, paragraph from the Catechism of the Catholic Church also references another prophecy of, uh, of Jesus. Um, um, it's from, I believe it's from Matthew 23. I'll, I'll be trying to say it from memory to save time, so forgive me if I'm not word for word correct. But Jerusalem, uh, Jesus is prophesying again over Jerusalem immediately before the crucifixion, shortly before the crucifixion. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. I tell you truly, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So when will Jerusalem see him again when he returns in glory? And what's it mean that they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? It's when they receive him as the Messiah. So, so we see here the, um, uh, basically the two things. We see the scriptural basis for um, the relationship, the, the little link between the conversion of the Jews and the second coming. And um, we, uh, we see the, the failure of the Jews to recognize Christ as being part of the unfolding of salvation history. If I can stay on Romans 11 Please. for a moment and kind of flesh this out. The, um, the question is, there are a number of questions here. One is, why, <laughs> why is the, is the uh, widespread conversion of the Jews being held up until the full number of the Gentiles come in? Why do the Jews kind of have to be held out of the church by their failure to recognize Christ until the full number of Gentiles come in? Um, and that is a question that St. Paul himself answers, again in Romans 11. Um, so, so uh, going back to Romans 11, um, uh, now I will, we'll, anyway, again, I'll be reading some verses, starting from verse 1, but um, jumping forward a little bit at that point to tie some things together. So at the beginning of the chapter, St. Paul starts, I ask then, has God rejected his people by no means? I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So, first of all, this is important because here you have scriptural confirmation that the election of the Jews has not been rescinded. Right. But that somehow God did not reject his people despite the fact that they rejected him in rejecting Jesus. Uh, and then Paul goes on, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought meaning the Messiah. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. In other words, Israel failed to obtain what it sought, the coming of the Messiah, except for the elect who were allowed to see that Jesus was the Messiah, but the rest were hardened. God gave them a spirit of super eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. I've talked about that before. Then Paul continues, so I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Okay? It's two things here. Have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. In other words, yes, they failed. In a way, they failed because they failed to recognize Jesus. But it, was that a terminal failure? I mean, they stumbled, but did they fall? Right. Did they fall off the edge of the cliff? You know, did they part of fall into the abyss? By no means. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. In other words, God had to allow them to fall so that salvation could come to the Gentiles. Okay, why is that? We see that again, I think I mentioned this as early in the series, mm -hmm. but we see that in the book of Acts, that the, the burning question in the early church was, are Gentiles allowed to become Christian? Are non-Jews even allowed to be allowed into the church? Because here Jesus was a Jew, all the apostles were Jews, all the disciples were Jews, the 3,000 who converted at Pentecost when Peter preached them were all Jews. The entire first wave of Christians were all Jews. So then it, the question is, is, isn't this just for us? You know, these pagans, these you know, pork eaters, these, you know, these unclean people, you're not saying that this is for them too. This is the Jewish Messiah who came. We're supposed to let them into the church? 
So it was, that, that was the crisis in the early church. You know, did a Gentile have to first become Jewish before he qualified for entry into the church? I'm not making this up. This is there in the book of <laughs> Acts. You know, I encourage all, all of our listeners to go read it. Now, it was precisely the failure of the Jews to accept Jesus that opened the floodgates for the Gentiles. I mean, in, in other words, obviously when the Jews didn't enter the church, it left room for the Gentiles. It, it, the danger of looking like Christianity was only for Jews was kind of eliminated or ended by the Jews' failure to enter the church. Now, now it's no longer limited to a race, but now it has opened up to all people who will just turn to God. That's right, which was always the intention, of course, of Christ and of Christianity, but it, it was far from evident to the early Christians whether they were of Jewish origin or Gentile origin. Right. God had to make it evident to them, and he made it evident to them in part by the failure of the Jews to enter. Then Paul goes on, um, but if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Okay? So the Jews' failure meant riches for the world. Um, their failure meant riches for the Gentiles, right? It was their failure to Absolutely. receive Jesus, to realize he was the Messiah, that meant the richness of salvation and the church for the Gentiles. But if their failure meant so many riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? If, if their failure to recognize Jesus was a blessing for the church, how much more of a blessing for the church? Which is the second coming. Which is, um, which is the second coming, the yeah. Second coming. Their full inclusion meaning, yes. I think that's a very logical... I mean, you, you kind of not only jumped ahead of me, but you actually kind of opened my eyes to something there. But absolutely, that, that how much more will their full inclusion mean could easily be a reference uh, specifically to the second coming, that their full inclusion will mean the ultimate grace of the second coming. Beautiful. Um, going back to, to Romans 11, um, the, um, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Okay, the Jews' rejection of Christ meant the reconciliation of the world, the reconciliation of the non-Jewish world, the entire world, to God through the church. But if their rejection meant the, reconciliation world, uh, meant the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? And you've already pointed out through this series how they were cut off from that sacramental life with the rejection of Jesus. So when we see life from the dead, it's that return to that sacramental. It's the return grace. to the sacramental life but it's, it's something else associated with the second coming, in, in my opinion. Obviously, there's something speculative about everything I'm doing now, because when you're talking about biblical prophecy, when you're talking about what these deep mysteries mean, it's not like talking about history. It's not like talking about you know, dogma or canon law. And, and it shouldn't be mistaken for that. What I'm, what I'm trying to expound here is something that makes compelling sense to me, but that doesn't make it dogma and it doesn't make it certain. But with that caveat, let me go on and say, we know something else about the second coming, which is the second coming is to be preceded by something which is known as the great apostasy, a, great, a widespread falling away from the faith. Um, we know that from at least two sources. We know that from the words of Jesus himself. He says, before the crucifixion, he says, when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith left on the face of the earth? And that's always been understood to be referring to a doctrine known as the Great Apostasy, which was declared a dogma at the Council of Trent that the, um, the Second Coming must be preceded by this Great Apostasy, by widespread falling away from the faith. So when you combine that sense of the Great Apostasy, or that teaching about the Great Apostasy, that dogma about the Great Apostasy, with the phrase, the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled, and um, the other thing we know, both from Scripture and from the Council of Trent dogmatically, that the Second Coming must be preceded by the Gospel being preached throughout the world. Right. You have this picture that you have this time of the Gentiles where the Gospel is going to be preached throughout the Gentile world. The full number of the Gentiles will come in. In other words, all of the Gentiles out there prepared to recognize Jesus will be brought into the church, then it will almost, in some sense, become overripe, and there'll be a falling away from the church on the part of the Gentiles, 
and the times of the Gentiles will be completed, there'll be the great apostasy, and that falling away on the part of the Gentiles will be compensated for by the flooding in of the Jews, which will, who will then sort of complete the church. The, the, the church essentially having originally been given to the Jews through Judaism, I'm using church in the broad sense of right. the covenant of salvation, originally to the Jews, and then the Jews were kind of put in suspended animation while it was spread out to the Gentiles, phase two. And then phase three is bringing the Jews back in. And so then you have first the Jews, then you have the Gentiles, then you have the Jews and Gentiles, then you have the whole package, then you have the end of the world and the second coming, essentially. So God makes it available to everyone, gives everyone the opportunity to choose him. And then when that period is over, you see the the reinstitution or the, or the, the fulfilling of the, the, the original covenant. That's exactly right. And, and St. Paul has a beautiful image to describe this, which is the image of the olive tree, which is again in Romans chapter 11. So let me, Please. Let me read that image. Um, the, um, I'll start uh, around uh, verse 16. Um, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. So St. Paul is comparing sort of the tree of salvation to this olive tree. And he's saying that um, it's this cultivated olive tree and some of the branches of that cultivated olive tree were broken off. That's the Jews who failed to recognize Jesus. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, the wild olive shoot being the Gentiles who weren't originally part of that tree, but who were grafted in to that original tree, grafted into Judaism, so to speak, right. through um, entry into the church, do not boast over the branches who were broken off. Bec if you do boast, remember, it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast only through your faith. Do not become proud, but stand in awe. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Um, and even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So in that image from, from farming, essentially, you have the whole picture. You have the original olive tree, the, the salvation which flowed through Judaism. You have the branches which were broken off to make room for the wild olive branches. In other words, the Jews who were not given the grace of faith broken off from the tree so the wild olive branches, the Gentiles, could be grafted back in. But if you're one of those grafted in branches, in other words, a Gentile in the church, don't boast over the unbelieving Jews because God has the power to graft them in back in again, and he will, in fact, at the end of time. And when he does, how much better will be they be suited to the olive tree because they were, were originally a part of it. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for, for pulling all that together, and that really helps pull together these shows where you've been building this case and now you, you bring it to uh, the start of the climax as we, as we uh, ha are going to have to wrap up this show and, and probably pick this up and, and, and finish uh, in the next show. But uh, thank you again for being with us and, and thank you for being with us. We hope you'll join us again next time as we continue to go through The Salvation is from the Jews by Roy Showman. We'll uh, wrap it up in the next couple of episodes with um, the last chapter. So thank you very much. God bless you.